of Observer Research Foundation. And I'm Kimberly Johnson. I'm the deputy chief news editor at the Wall Street Journal in New York. So to begin, I want to take a step back and look at the, the global risk report put out by WEF um, a couple of weeks ago. And it, what it said, it was that as this year begins, as we enter 2023, we're seeing some older risks, inflation, the cost of living crisis, trade wars, geopolitical confrontations, and also social unrest. And 80% of experts expect these kinds of volatile risks to continue over the next two years. And over the next 10 years, there's the expectation that we will see more social and environmental risk. And so Minister, I'm going to start with you. And so just give us your thoughts for a minute or so as we go around. What have you observed this week? Where did you, what were you thinking when you came here? And um, what, what are you taking away in terms of risk, particularly as you go back home? Well, thank you very much. Um, as you have correctly stated just now about risk, uh, it sounds very familiar. Uh, the last couple of years is about risk, about inflation, energy, and it relates back to cost of living, right? Um, of course, they have geopolitics today. And the past one week, um, if I can summarize what I think uh, would be the key risk factors, one is we have to look at both short-term and long-term risks. So in the short-term risk, the cost of living, um, I mean, from the perspective of emerging markets, uh, developing economies, uh, this cost of living issue started even before, uh, pre before the pandemic. And of course, pandemic has exacerbated it, make it made it worse, uh, made it very clear that the vulnerable groups are more affected uh, and countries which are not as um, strong or in a strong position has suffered more. And actually, if you look at post-pandemic, many countries are still yet to recover to their pre-pandemic level. And on top of that, and as we hear in the last one week, um, we are talking about trade issues, right? But because at the end of the day, uh, impediment to trade will be impediment to growth as well, right? Um, and in the longer term, <clears throat> another theme in this forum is about sustainability, right? Um, and talking about climate change, for example, even in the region, in, in Southeast Asia, we're seeing flooding happening more frequently, more, it's more severe. But governments uh, across the region, um, and I'm sure in many other economies as well, have to balance between this short term and long term. <coughs> and it's about managing the risk and about mitigating the risk. Do we have the resources to do so? Um, there are social impact to some of the um, long term risks, um, as I mentioned. Um, some countries are not able uh, to balance uh, the short term and long term because of the resource uh, constraint. Already, um, you know, I was the Minister of Finance before and many countries have to increase their deficit by twofold, right? Uh, the fiscal position is already uh, very much constrained uh, and now faced with the challenges going forward. Um, we've seen we've, you know, the, frequently in this, uh, this WEF about French shoring, reshoring, onshoring, uh, and that has an impact uh, in the longer term uh, to global trade and global growth. Uh, so to me, um, what we've taken away uh, during this past one week is that trade matters, right? Uh, trade matters because it brings prosperity. Um, I think global economies, especially developed economies, have to play a role uh, in ensuring that uh, in the longer term, uh, there is a need to balance between security as well as growth. Okay. Um, and before we get to Gary, I'm going to encourage people to, to tweet and to post on social media um, about the session. And if you do so, please use the hashtag WEF23. Um, and so, Gary, you, you bring a, a business, particularly technology business perspective to this. And one of the, the great things about WEF and Davos is that it brings together government, business and civil society. And so what, what have been your takeaways this week? A, a few things. Um, I'm walking away actually quite encouraged. You know, there's a, a number of advances in technology that were talked about here at the conference that I think are very meaningful and will impact the lives of many people around the globe. There's been lots of discussion about the power of AI, and obviously there's some risk that comes with that, but with the right guardrails, it could be incredibly impactful to all individuals around the globe. 
There's been lots of discussion around quantum computing and the impact that it can have on certain sectors like healthcare. And, and broadly speaking, I think tech has been transformative um, to everyone's lives. And yes, with that comes some complexity and some risk, obviously. Um, I live specifically in the cyber world where cyber risk has been a very broad topic of conversation here at the conference. Those issues have not gotten smaller. They are much larger. And if you look at the um, risk report that was published, it was really highlighted as a short-term and a long-term risk. I think it's something that we will see for a very long time. And we just fundamentally need to build resilience. Part of this is, and there were some very good conversations here at the conference, is there needs to be better public-private cooperation. We think fundamentally that that public-private cooperation can help drive resilience both on the government side and more broadly across society. And those are very important moves because as the world broad, broadly digitizes and more capabilities come online from governments as well as from uh, private companies, uh, there's so much opportunity there, but it needs, needs to be managed with uh, a focus on resilience. Okay, we'll come back to resilience. Um, Nari, what are you, what are you seeing and what's, what's top of mind for you after this week? Yeah, so um, congratulations to the WEF on a terrific global risk report. I do recommend you, you take a look at it. It, it lays out um, some of the things that we've talked about and both the minister and Gary have mentioned the kind of climate risk, which it headlines as a big long-term risk. So what's my takeaway on, on the climate discussion this week? Fantastic headlining of climate and sustainability across most discussions. Tremendous willingness by all parties, as, as you're pointing to Gary, to take um, what needs to, to be done seriously. Um, quite a lot of finance being, being promised or, or sitting in the wings. But here's the rub. There's two very different conversations going on. And until they're brought together in one, I don't see a lot happening that needs to happen. And those two conversations are one, the conversation among government leaders who are talking about goals, commitments, aspirations, you know, the things they'd like to see and are saying to the private sector, so on the basis of these verbal commitments that we're making together, please go ahead and invest billions. And the private sector is saying, okay, we do have billions to invest, but we can't invest them on the basis of woolly aspirations. If we did, if you take a publicly listed company and say, invest your billions against a woolly aspiration, they'll pretty soon find themselves ousted by ac activist investors, by um, hostile takeover, whatever, right? So the conversation has to come together where governments set clear permanent goalposts and the private sector starts truly investing, knowing that that's where the goalposts are. So that's the climate piece. The second piece is the security piece, which is, as you were saying, Minister, it's the shorter term risk. So what struck me, and it goes to Gary's point about AI, incredible intensity of energy and commitment and funding into fashioning new military technologies based on AI because, um, because of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the desire to support Ukrainians in upholding their own sovereignty. But in a private conversation, somebody said to me, shouldn't we be testing that new dazzling military AI, which can be front loaded onto what looks like a gaming app and you can start conducting your war from there. Shouldn't we get a room full of the leaders of the most vicious criminal networks and ask them what they would do with that technology? And then shouldn't we think about those answers in how we start thinking about safeguards around it? So to me, that's a risk that I think we haven't fully surfaced in this, in this WEF and that needs to be thought about. And then just my third and final point would be the development crisis which is upon us. COVID created a development crisis which is affecting billions of people in the world. There has been a literacy gap. Two years of lost education has meant that there are millions of children across the world who haven't got enough basic literacy now to continue their education. This could be a lost generation unless urgent steps aren't taken now. Those very same children are now, because of the war in Ukraine, 
and because of what's happening in the global economy, facing a food crisis which is affecting far more people in every, in every, in every developing country and even in wealthy countries because of the food and energy and cost of living crisis which the minister mentioned. That hunger, that famine, the fact that even in the country I live in, in the United Kingdom, children are going to school desperately hungry means they cannot learn. So they've already got a two year gap and now they can't learn. And then on top of that, we have a, a real debt crisis in the poorer countries of the world because of the strong dollar and increasing interest rates. That's a development emergency. And I want to just underscore that because in previous Davos's, we were able to sit and say, wow, the last decade, we have really made progress on the world's development goals. We could see huge gains in education, health, um, across the poorest communities of the world. And now the development experts here are telling us that we've been set back by a decade. And just to put that clearly, that means millions of children, hungry, illiterate. What is their future going to look like? So I just want to really underscore that. I, I would love to see the intensity of energy, of excitement about AI, of commitment to doing something that we've seen on both climate and on security applied to the much more immediate development crisis that we face. So that's my takeaway. <laughs> we'll come back to many of those points, um, but I want to give Samir a chance to, to jump in and, and maybe for folks who are not familiar, tell us a bit about um, the Observer Research Foundation. Oh, so we are a think tank uh, located out of India. We have uh, four physical centers, including one in DC, which is an affiliate now. Okay. And we do a broad range of research on issues from foreign policy to social policy and everything in between. I think it's only Bollywood and culture we don't research on. Mm -hmm. uh, we should, but uh, uh, it's, it's a pretty uh, white tent mm -hmm. uh, across. And, and of course, uh, we still try to bring all persuasions within that tent from across the political ideologies and, and social. But, you know, the risk report uh, for me is, um, is interesting because you read the report, uh, you engage with the report, and then you hear the conversations. And I'm going to make three observations. I'm not going to make any pronouncements. So we know that there's a climate challenge that is unfolding and, and, and uh, the previous speaker mentioned that. So both in terms of immediate as well as long term and, and you see how progressively it is worsening. The climate risk becomes far more pronounced 10 years from now than it is say two years from now. You see that happening. You see the trend in terms of assessments. The conversations uh, are very optimistic. So if you if you were sitting in panels uh, across this um, uh, across the Congress Center, you would see most people think that they've got they've got the solution, they've got the pathways, they've got the money, they are investing in the right technologies, they are building the the right future. And I think there is something dystopian about that. That here experts are saying we are heading into a crisis, and those who can do something about it believe they've got it. And I think this is something that we should be really thinking about. If are we fueling the risk? by not really assessing what is, and I think you pointed to one, that one, how do we move the largest chunk of monies to geographies that typically have not received such kind of money and the, and the kind of money that is available is not necessarily keen on investing in those geographies. So let me give you one example. One third of future emissions can be mitigated if uh, a large pool of capital can reach India over the next 10 years. Now, India is not rated a triple A rate. It's not rated uh, in a manner that allows low cost capital. The prices are very high. Uh, uh, certain kind of funds can't invest in it. Pension funds and insurance funds. And uh, this is true for the entire African continent as well. And large parts of uh, Asia and Latin America, Malaysia, you can name the country and we receive very high cost capital. Now, if climate risk is a global challenge, then why are we uh, holding back global capital to be deployed at scale in geographies where the largest amount of returns uh, to our efforts can, can emerge from. So I think the first is, can we really rethink pricing capital, understanding risk, and how do we, in a sense, designate, and this is just an idea, how do we designate global climate projects that are able to draw capital at cost that, say, projects in Europe and America today benefit from? So I think that's one arrangement. Is it through insurances? We are not hearing that. We are still talking about changing the European system. Oh, we did well against Russia. Oh, we did this. Listen, you guys are not going to save the planet. 
the largest emissions are going to come from geographies that are that are uh, that are different that are far away and unless we can take the savings the 4 300 to 400 trillion dollars that are available in various kinds of funds unless we can find pathways to take them to geographies where the largest emissions are going to emerge we are not going to respond to the climate challenge so that's one observation the second is war right and it's interesting that uh, uh, the risk report says it's it's uh, it's uh, uh, i think 14 though it's it, it's in double digits it's not that high up but the conversations are all about war. It's all about winning the war. It's, uh, I've also heard cautionary notes which say that, listen, this is a war Putin can't lose. Now, are we underplaying the significance of what we are sitting on? And I worry. I worry that we are dismissing the war uh, in, our, in our conversations as something that is going in one direction and it's going to lead to a certain conclusion. Now, folks with nuclear weapons don't lose wars. And we need to think about it. I think we have been ignoring that. And my final point, I think it's on the economy. Uh, again, the risk report says cost of living and in a sense proxy for economy is the most important current risk. If you talk to everyone, there's for me naive optimism. Oh, we are back. Uh, inflation has peaked. China is back. And, 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 the, and the economic prospects are, uh, are huge. You hear the other economists in certain closed door meetings and they are cautioning you that we are entering a new phase where interest rates will remain high, where inflation is not going to go down. The nature of our transactions have changed perhaps for a significant period of time ahead. And yet you see a euphoria. It's interesting. Uh, I hope, I hope that the optimists win. Uh, uh, but I hope that naive optimism doesn't fuel the risks that, and we have to live with the risks that are exaggerated because we have not paid enough attention to uh, some of the systemic and underlying forces that have perhaps changed this decade. So listening to all of you, you've all talked about different things. Do we think it's really interesting because the theme of WEF is cooperation in a fragmented world. Are we thinking of risk and the solution to those risks in a siloed, fragmented way? Because if children are behind and in reading and they're going to school hungry, they are not growing up to be effective, pro productive members of society. Gary can't hire them. If we're we're looking at climate change, you know, you may have to think of storms in California. You may have to think of relocating things. All of these things are interconnected. Do you feel that? we are too siloed in our thinking about the solutions. Yeah, I, I think one of the silos is the silo between what happens at national level and what happens at global level. And there's, there's too much of a tendency of people either to say that global cooperation can solve all these problems, mm -hmm. when actually a lot of these problems need to be solved by national governments. Hunger, you know, um, um, and, and the development crisis needs to be sold at national level, but with some international cooperation support. So, so the international cooperation needs to proceed in the areas which permit governments to do things which they couldn't otherwise do. So the debt crisis is not an inevitable crisis. We actually have the institutions, we have the mechanisms to prevent the debt crisis creating a development crisis. We have institutions like the IMF, the World Bank and regional development banks. We have to absolutely focus on sweating them and not asking them to do a million other things, but asking them to do this one urgent thing, which is to cooperate, to permit governments to then um, serve their populations. I, I would really underscore, though, that national governments, you know, that there's a reason why we're seeing real polarization in countries across the world. And it's Kimberly, it is what you say. It's people looking at how many people in their own countries are underserved and saying, who is it that's serving them? And they're looking at us sitting here in Davos saying, what are those guys doing? So do you have any thoughts on this, Samir? No, I, I, I think you, it's right. You know, okay, let's go back to the last two years, the pandemic. Uh, and we can all criticize clumsy global efforts and coordination, et cetera, et cetera. But let's be honest. When I was in my house, locked in for months, it was my government I was turning to. When there was crisis, it was my government, my prime minister, our cabinet, our health ministers, our health systems, our uh, second and third tier of governance that we were turning to. In some sense, uh, we should uh, drop the pariah, the, 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 prof, the, the, the complex of being this angel that can solve, the, you know, the global community can solve everything that happens locally. But 
I don't think we should underplay the importance of global coordination and cooperation. Uh, so it, it tells you both things. It tells you the importance of national governments and expectations of people from those. So in a sense, the response has to come from national governments. But I believe that the pandemic also tells us a second story, that we literally tied the hands of national governments in the emerging and developing countries. So here the citizens were looking at them, looking up to them, wanting vaccines. And here were uh, rich countries holding the vaccines. Right now, I think international cooperation that allows national systems to deliver is the ideal framework. Uh, it's not going to be easy to achieve that because uh, increasingly some of the most important essential services and needs of people are no longer served by the public sector. They're in the private domain and governments uh, all over the world are struggling to mobilize their private sectors in the direction of action that they seek. And I think that's the cost of uh, uh, believing in markets uh, or, or believing in the power of markets to be efficient. So I think somewhere along the way, uh, there's someone in the room who works on values and, and ethics. I think somewhere along the way, we need to now internalize that markets may be efficient, but they may not be effective. And I think that learning from the pandemic is important, that uh, global marketplaces is not global cooperation. If we leave uh, the emerging world and the developing world to the market forces, you are not necessarily going to achieve the right outcomes. Oh, we will create green finance. No, it's not going to happen like that. Unless you have, you know, I was telling someone, unless a big developed uh, city in the world, the, one of the big four, goes down to a hurricane or goes down to a super cyclone or goes down to a climatic event, we are not going to see war on climate change. You know, as long as uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia and, and South Asia continue to be flooded, it's going to be, you know, let's have a Bono concert and get some money and send it to them. But till a big city goes down, war on climate change is not going to begin. And then the developed world public sector will start exerting its muscles. I think uh, uh, the, the, the public sector in the developing countries still are effective. L limited means all the inefficiencies of their realities, but uh, the public sector in the developed world has forgotten how to govern. Incentives has become their only way of managing their companies. They've forgotten that there are sticks to be used sometimes. It, during the pandemic, they use some of it. I think that's a good lesson. I hope they can use it more. Okay. Minister, you wanted to jump in and go together? Yeah, okay, well, I mean, you mentioned a few times about what government uh, has done uh, during the pandemic, I think. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, recovery has been uneven, right? And I think I agree with you, um, this food crisis, and we've seen in many uh, of these countries, and what government has done immediately uh, is to have hand out with cash benefits, uh, food programs, etc. And it's still actually happening. And we've seen from the report as well, IMF World Bank has actually have revised downward the GDP forecast globally many times, right? And if you look at um, investment into the region, uh, into the, uh, developing uh, economies, especially uh, during the pandemic, it was down by 70%. Mm -hmm. And during the global financial crisis, it was down by 50%. So it shows how bad it was uh, during that period and how difficult it is to actually recover in light of what has been highlighted in the global risk report. Even in terms of growth, um, Yes, admittedly, uh, we can see investment going up again uh, post pandemic, but it's up about three and a half percent. That's just half of what it was. It, it's, the emerging economies grew in terms of investment about seven percent over the last 10 years. And just during that recovery period, period only it went up by 3.5 percent. We've seen unemployment rate going down, but still at a level which it was not pre pandemic. And in, for government, uh, having to deal with this in the immediate term, and at the same time, and we hear the discussion about climate change, and I think, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, there need to be a clear roadmap to achieving what we all want to achieve. I think we all have the same end goal. You know, most countries have the target net zero by 2050, uh, some on 2040, but the, the roadmap is there. But for countries which is still recovering uh, from post pandemic and at the same time facing the immediate uh, risks, uh, as highlighted, you know, especially on cost of living, etc., then having to plan to meet those targets. And even even uh, for, for, and you must remember, most developing nations, emerging economies, uh, is driven by small medium enterprises, is driven by small businesses, and they do not have the resources to comply uh, with the timeline uh, given to them. Uh, so that roadmap is important, I agree. Um, we need to have a clearer uh, roadmap, but engagement is key because that roadmap cannot be dictated by certain groups. Uh, because, like you said, every nation has its own uh, challenges 
uh, that we have to meet. And, and of course, every nation, even within, even within the emerging markets, have, is at a different stage of development. So I think, it's, I think the foundation of all this is, of course, trust. Right? I think we need to continue to collaborate, continue to engage. We can, we can agree to disagree. But what's important is for us to start having this uh, discussion, because in the longer term, um, you will see that um, whatever long-term object uh, mission that we have is going to be difficult to achieve if we can't resolve uh, the short-term issues that we are facing today. So Gary, you're the CEO of a, of a business. Um, businesses are always looking to be more effective and to build resiliency and looking at short-term and long-term headwinds. And so how do you do you just live with the risk? Do you, what do you build, try to build in as a company leader to try to weather some of these shocks? And how do you see everything that your colleagues here are talking about is interconnected? Yeah, it's so interesting because I think all these risks are very much interconnected. And um, one of the things that I think about every day is agility and the ability to mobilize around efforts that have broad impact, um, broad in impact from an outcomes point of view, and outcomes that are important to our stakeholders. And so it really is um, it's a cultural aspect. And how do you drive that across the organization, the engagement broadly with customers, and ensuring that as we think about that broader stakeholder community, how do we build enough agility that we can respond as risks evolve? Because as, as you were saying, and I think the report um, pointed this out in a really interesting way, the interconnectedness of all these risks then requires businesses to be very thoughtful about how to be able to respond no matter what happens. And if you just go back to COVID, you know, while it had horrible impacts around the globe, one of the positive things is we learned how to change overnight. And all of us work differently sitting, sitting on our couch doing our jobs from home. And I don't know that anybody would have been able to forecast that we could actually do that. I don't think anyone would have thought that the global economy would have continued through what was a horrific pandemic. And so I think that ability to respond and that agileness is something that has to be baked in. And I think we all need to be thinking about that every day because I don't think we can always fully anticipate what's coming. Yeah. But I think one point on the pandemic is that not everyone was a white collar worker who could work from home. And That's so right. if you yeah. were delivering groceries or Amazon boxes or a first responder, you were working. Mm -hmm. And I think the pandemic helped us see that that's an inequality gap in many ways. People who had no other choice but to brave the streets of you know, New York, you know, name a city around the world to, to do their job. And so there's, there are obviously a personal health risk associated with that, but potentially many of us who are here were able to see that there is disparity and that you know there is a privilege that we're all able to sit on our couch um and and work from home but it definitely did highlight that disparity but it also created a whole new set of jobs that didn't exist before right. and so doordash doordash delivery people and a lot of other roles got created over almost overnight that has spurred what has been an incredible demand for talent at all levels um you know as we think about the global economy going forward is so interesting to see a world where labor is still incredibly tight at, at very at very different levels across different strata. So um, can, yeah. I, can I jump in on yeah, that, sure. Gary, because I think it's exactly that kind of innovation and agility that we now need to apply to, you know, the food crisis I'm mm -hmm. talking about. The food crisis, the fact that, that children in wealthy countries are hungry is what you're saying, Kimberly, because their families came out of COVID very, very fragile and weakened, having lost livelihoods. But it did show us that governments can do when they, when they need to, right? But there is, I just want to underscore, there is no shortage of food in the world. Correct. The world has plenty of food to feed every child. And let's not forget when a child lacks food, they suffer stunting, which means they can never catch up their brain literally cannot develop. So there's plenty of food in the world. So the solution to the food crisis is within our grasp. Mm 
It is about cooperation. It is about, if we go back to the brilliant work of Amartya Sen and John Dres, it's about putting cash in the hands of poor families so they can buy food and food markets can work. It's that simple. So we can do it. Okay. We're going to go to questions. Um, and please, please stand and introduce yourself quickly. Yes. Right here in the front, right there. Thank you. I'm Dr. Mandeep Rai, and thank you for the shout out regarding being the author of The Values Compass. Thank you. Um, in terms of people, really what we're talking about is how to manage people's lives and livelihoods. Do you feel that there's, if you were to concentrate on one one domain or one value, what would each of you say was the one thing that could give us the most bang for our buck? If we were to concentrate on this, we would get the biggest certainty in this very uncertain world. Thank you. Does so anyone want to tackle that? <clears throat> Let me go. Well, let me take a go. I, 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 think, I think we have to rebuild communities here. So I think for me, uh, the idea of being part of communities is important. Uh, and it is communities that got us through the pandemic. Listen, government and govern, governments were actually caught napping, right? Uh, it, it, to be honest, the first few months, uh, whether you were in the US or you were anywhere else, the governments had no clue. It was communities that rallied. And I think that camaraderie of uh, the ability to actually relate to each other, empathy and, and connect and connectedness, I think is really important. Uh, even for big mega responses, it is communities that will eventually respond to it. And those communities, I, I am not, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily describing those. I think that's a long answer. But communities of purpose, communities of care and communities of action. Uh, these three communities are important. We saw the pandemic give us a glimpse of the power of these communities. Uh, and I think that's something we should be investing in? For me, it's, it's dignity. And it's, it's dignity because if you strip people of their dignity, they become fearful, angry, and desperate. They have no stake in a system that's not giving them a minimum of dignity. There's no, there's no dignity to having a job which pays so little. <clears throat> you know, there, are, there, is a, there are places in the United Kingdom where food banks have been opened in hospitals because the people who work full time in the hospitals are not earning enough in this food and energy crisis to buy their own food. That's not dignified for these hardworking people. So for me, it's dignity. We should start there. And I would go back to um, the earlier comment on community, and I think interconnectedness now really matters, and it creates power in society, and that, that interconnectedness ultimately raises the awareness of all of these issues, that if we didn't have that, I don't think we could accomplish anything. Yeah. Well, to me, you have to go back to basics, you've got to go back to fundamentals. Um, it is all about human uh, development. We're looking at growth, but we've seen the growth has been very uneven. And I, you know, we touch a bit on digital. I think that's something that we also need to uh, bear in mind. The digital divide is widening, and this has impact on growth and the GDP per capita of countries. So I think we need to be mindful that the gap is growing. And one thing, to, one way to address it uh, is the advancement of technology that should be shared uh, with all. Okay. Any other questions? Sure, in the front. Thank you. I'm Hattie Samosir, the creator of Global Super Community Burn Hub. Considering like we have enough capital, scientists, innovators, other supporting resources, why it seems like we have not done much yet? Uh, what have been stopping us from taking risks to tackle those issues? Is it because we are shy or coming back to being selfish? <laughs> um, yeah. So we should be taking more risks. Why aren't we taking more risks? You know, I don't think you're taking risks if you deploy money to serve humankind. I, I think that's the problem. Deploying capital to where it is required has now become risk. And that's the financial architecture that needs to be radically reformed. If you're responding to climate change, and so what if you're putting money into Africa or, or Latin America? That's, that's, a global, that's a global challenge. It's, it's upon us. And we have to find ways 
of yes, I, I agree with Professor Woods, uh, of, of incentivizing investors or protecting their investments. So can we have uh, mega giga schemes that protect investors on the one hand, but on the other hand, price capital in a manner that recognizes that climate risk is bigger than any other political risk that decides the cost of capital. If, if climate is the biggest risk, why is political risk of a country considered bigger than climate risk? If, if we have global climate response that is Im, uh, an imperative, then we must redeploy and think about the financial architecture. I, so I think the idea that putting capital where it is required is risky is, is for me fundamentally flawed. Yep. But for me, it's about government, because the, the really big risks and problems that the world faces at the moment actually need government to create the conditions for solution. You can't win wars by leaving markets to work. You can't Good. face climate change down uh, leaving markets to work. You can't deal with the development crisis purely in market based. So we need governments. So what's happened to governments or government around the world? I would say this, I'm Dean of a school of government, but, <laughs> but the reason why I've built a school of government at Oxford is because for the last 30 years, we've seen governments disdained. People talk about, ah, oh, politicians, you know, ooh, imagine being a bureaucrat. Actually, we need some of our best, smartest, most innovative, agile people in the public sector, not because they will do what the private sector can do, but because we need them to create the ecosystem that unleashes the private sector mm. to do its absolutely best. And until we get real about that, until we start talking about making working in government, mm. working as a politician, something which is respected, something which we give value to, something which we applaud and nurture and encourage our very best people to do, I think it's hard to solve these problems. Mm. Yeah. I want to make sure everyone is able to get their questions in. Any other questions? Um, yes, sir, there. Hello, not a youngsters, uh, Global Shaper Community Lausanne. Um, one question that I have now, we've seen you know, the winds of war coming back to, to Europe for the first time in a while. And now many countries are calling as we are seeing that our, for example, military expenses are not enough to protect our own countries. I'm Italian originally, and I've seen that also my country has not fared well in that sense. We spend a lot of money on you know, uh, paying the salaries, of course, of our armed forces, but we don't spend nearly enough in the technology that is necessary. Mm -hmm. At the same time, as a young person, uh, I feel the imperative of tackling those kind of issues, but resources are limited. So do you have any kind of advice on how the frameworks for which we allocate resources and incentives should bear these two very different priorities? You may have stumped a panel, so... <laughs> <laughs> so I just don't want to do all the talking. Yeah, Minister, I think, I think this is a question for you. Exactly. <laughs> Well, that's a tough question. Right. Uh, it is a balance that I think EU has just realized you know, a lot of investment has been made, but not as much as, because there have never been a war in what, 100 years in, in, in Europe, right? So I think for, for, well, from my perspective, I mean, as, as an emerging market, we also never really invest much uh, in uh, defense, right? We've been spending a lot on education and healthcare. Uh, but of course, I think, again, you know, we need to put things into perspective. Um, the key for the global uh, economy, for human development, which I mentioned earlier, is to again focus again on what is what is good for the society. Um, so when it comes for investments, um, when you know, uh, wearing my previous hat, we always have to look at what brings the highest ROI. And and I agree with what you said. Um, I think we need to have a rethink on how to price risk, right? You know, when we were in school, we learned about capital asset pricing model and all that, and we understand the risk premium, but this is, things have changed, right? Because again, uh, perhaps we'd have to then factor in what you just said into that risk uh, premium, right? Uh, so because before this, the reason why governments don't invest as much as what you just said is because they don't put that as a variable into that risk premium. And perhaps we have to weight it accordingly, Right, perhaps, but to me personally, weightage on human development is larger than perhaps that because that will the cause of the whole problem is because of uh, you know issues about energy and etc. But to me, I think we need to relook uh, about 
what is risk, put a weighted to it, look back at what risk premium means, and then we can answer your questions. And I think different countries, different regions will have different uh, priorities. And as you correctly stated, um, some need more support than others. Uh, and we need to also look at that uh, holistically. Can I, can I say a quick thing on military expenditures? Because we, we can really learn lessons from history on this. If you're going to invest a whole lot in military and defence, it can be a fantastic way to develop good technology. It can be a fantastic way to develop an, a well-ordered um, military that abides by Geneva Conventions, that, that conducts war in what the world has de de decided is the most moral way. But equally, history tells us that there are, if you don't do certain things, a big increase in military expenditures goes straight into corruption and rent-seeking and the worst forms of excess, which then stay with you. And you know, think about the Cold War investments in um, what is now called the Democratic Republic of the Congo under Mobutu. Huge military investments in high-tech military that bore no benefit at all to the people of the country. So let's learn those lessons and use those military, um, the, the military budget increases wisely. So I think context matters. Uh, if you're living in a neighborhood like mine, I come from India, your neighbors don't give you any choice but to have a defense expenditure, right? So context matters. I, I, uh, I would agree that we have to spend a lot on SDGs and we do, and that's clearly one of the largest chunk of our outlays. But uh, we have never ignored the reality of an expansive dragon and an irrational actor on our Western borders. We have two live borders and we have to cater to them. Uh, and, and the debate in India is always why are we not increasing our defense budget enough? Mm. I think it, it, the, the question is very different, right? So uh, sometimes your neighborhood forces you to, to, and perhaps Europe has learned that the hard way. Uh, we have endured that for a while now, since pretty much our birth. We've had to manage two borders, right? Since, since we were born as a nation, that's one part. But the second part is that uh, that's also true for our neighbors. Right? Uh, our investing into our defense budget also means that others in the neighborhood who are inimical to us are also investing in the budget. And that's the point uh, Professor Woods was, was raising. Now, because Pakistan was investing and investing into the army, military, industrial complex so much, uh, the army took control of the country. So you have simple producers that are produced by the 4G Foundation, one of the foundations run by the country. So I think that's the perverse uh, um, the outcome. Of, of putting too much money uh, into your de defense establishment that you actually corrode democracy to the extent that when there are floods in Pakistan, the army has to come and rescue them. They don't have a civil response system. When you have any sorts of emergency, it is the military that has to come to the aid, undermining the credibility of the civilian architecture. So you have a vicious cycle where investments in the military end of your society have resulted in the diminishing of your democratic and civil society institutions completely. So that's the, I think that's the point you mentioned Congo, I'm giving you a more uh, a modern example or, or, or a more, or, or a more uh, approximate example from where I live, which also, by the way, has nuclear weapons. So think about it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think we have time possibly for one more question. Okay. So my last question is, so do we just live with these risks? In the short term, at least, because it seems it's going to take a gargantuan effort by all parties to to really make tangible change. So I just want to say it's not the case that all risks should be avoided, right? There are some risks that should be taken. And part of the, the reason to analyze risks is to say, who's going to bear the burden if we take this risk? We're going to have to take some risks to deal with these problems. We're going to have to take risks, you know, on climate, on insecurity, on development. Um, I think for me, the guiding question is who's going to bear the brunt if it goes wrong? And how do we think about that as we take the risk? Not to say we shouldn't take the risk. So risks, you know, there's, there's a risk that we, that we treat all risks as negative and all risks to be avoided. And so we, we all should sit in a room with cotton wool around us and, and, and hope nothing goes wrong. Right. So completely agree with that. Just another idea. I think living with risks is also now about making certain governance, government strategic decisions. For example, let me give you uh, one a real example that all of us have to grapple with now. Um, we know, irrespective of 
how ambitious and how efficient we may be in delivering those ambitions in terms of climate mitigation, we are going to be hitting a 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees rise in temperature, depending on how well we do. That is going to happen, which means already, and this is yesterday, we are seeing floodings, we are seeing uh, sea, le sea levels rising, we are seeing uh, folks lose, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, irrigable land. You're, you're seeing these changes already upon us. So the, there's one concept. Living with risks could also mean strategic retreat, that we have to start thinking about actually, uh, in a sense, conceding that certain areas cannot be saved. Are we thinking about it? Instead of waiting for, for forced migration due to climate action, are we really thinking about bringing communities to higher ground or, 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 or dry ground or creating incentives to, to create clusters that can move people from harm's way to, uh, to, to, to safer territory? We have to be thinking about. So living with risks is also about understanding that there are solutions that we will have to take, which, which will allow us to navigate those risks. Besides, of course, pricing them and, 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 and taking a call on, on, on on, on making some of those points. Right. Gary? I think about the fact that we will always be faced with risks that we have to take, but there's a broader thinking about where can we build some level of resilience that we have the ability to respond when some of these events happen. And you can see some really good examples of that across society, across tech, across other um, areas, but I think a big aspect of this is how do we find in those higher priority risks, how do we build some resilience mm -hmm. so that we don't suffer the absolute downturns that could ultimately happen? And finally, Minister. Well, I agree. We have to live with risks. You know, we, 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 we live with this every day. You know, we, we, what I think is important is learning how to understand how to mitigate that risk. I mean, we go in the car, we wear a seatbelt, for example. But uh, for, for the economies and for public sector, uh, you rightly said that what happened if that failure, mm -hmm. you know, who's going to pay the price for taking that risk? So to me, um, I mean, wearing my you know, public sector hat, I think one thing that markets also have to understand, uh, of course, markets are imperfect, but government alone cannot resolve uh, issues about risk. Uh, so there is a need to be to have collaboration with civil societies, uh, with companies. So it has to be a whole of nation approach uh, towards managing a risk. Mm -hmm. okay. That's a good way to wrap that up. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank our panelists. Um, I'd like to thank the audience in person and virtually. Um, and that concludes our session. Thank you. <laughs>